Hello, Community Action. We're going to give folks a chance to get into the Zoom room, as it were. I know it takes a minute or two for large groups of registrants to roll through, so we'll just give it a, a minute here. We have over 500 people who've registered for today, so thank you, Community Action, for your attention to uh, this important issue here today. I'm just going to give it another few seconds here to let people get into the room. The numbers are still increasing. If you are planning on being in this webinar talking about CSBG care spending, you are in the right place. All right, the numbers have slowed. Let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. Denise Harlow, CEO here of the National Community Action Partnership, and we're really glad that you're with us here today. Uh, today's webinar is an important webinar for all of us to be a part of as we sit here in the middle of April. We know that in less than six months, CSBG CARES will need to be fully expended. And so while we know that the clock is ticking, it is still clicking, ticking at a very reasonable sound. We have time to make plans, to pivot, to make some changes if we need to. So we wanted to have a conversation here today with the national partners, with OCS, and with you, so we can really get a handle on where we sit um, as a community action network. A few technical pieces. We are recording today's webinar. You will get a copy of the slide deck as well. So we will send it to everybody who registered for today, both the recording and the slide deck. We are in webinar mode, which means everyone is muted. So if you could please use the chat window for your questions, that would be great. We will pause periodically to take a look at the chat window. And we know you've become very adept at using that chat window. So please include your questions if you possibly can in that space. I think we also have the Q&A window open available if need be, but that's sometimes a little bit more challenging. So please use the chat. All right, well, let's get started here today. Let's go to, um, I, yeah, to this slide, thank you. I'm gonna start us off with the promise of community action. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. We start everything with the promise, right? Because we know that all of our work, while we all have different missions and different logos and all different names, all those sorts of things, we are grounded in this promise that community action truly changes people's lives. And in this moment of COVID, embodying the spirit of hope is truly what resonates with me today. Next slide, please. So we are joined by a panel of heavy hitters here today. So I am glad you are with us. We are going to get answers to your questions if we possibly can, and we will get back to you where we cannot. We're joined by Sharice Johnson from the Office of Community Services, David Bradley, the National Community Action Foundation, Allison Malouf from CapLaw, Jeannie Chaffin, who's the interim ED over at NASCASP at the moment, and Lana Shope, who is overseeing the CARES Training and Technical Assistance Project here at NCAP. So again, thank you so much for being with us here today. Let's go to the next slide. We're here to Sharice in a moment, but I kind of want to set the stage. Again, as I mentioned, we have a, clicking to a, a ticking clock behind us, right? September 30, except for the small states, and you know who you are, and we'll, we'll put some of the, the names of those small states in the chat as well. But for the vast majority of states, tribes, and territories, right, we have a deadline. September 30, 2022. Now, we're, Sharice is going to talk here in a moment about the tie to what's, you know, in the CARES Act and David will as well. But please keep in mind that all of us are still living within a global pandemic. When we see the impact of inflation on gas prices, food prices, rent, we know that CSBG and CSBG CARES can respond to these impacts across the country. Whether it's water assistance, utility assistance, we know our families are facing emergency needs. But we also know kids were out of school for quite a bit, right? They had a lot of online learning. There's loss of learning for many children across this country. We have summer coming. There's opportunities there too to help improve and reground kids um, and get them ready for next year's school year. There are a lot of things we're going to talk about here today. We're going to give you some strategies that we've put together in, co in cooperation and partnership with the national partners, as well as with the network and state associations, local agencies, and state offices. We want to add to this list. We'd love to hear your ideas. 
But please know, we know you can spend this money and we'll do so in accountable ways and in ways that impact families. We also know you're tired. The burden that you're carrying every day is immense. And so thank you. Thank you for everything you are doing. So I look forward to today's conversation and Sharice, I'm gonna turn the ball over to you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Denise. Hello, everyone. I'm Sharice Johnson, the Division Director for CSBG. On behalf of the Office of Community Services under the leadership of Dr. Howard, Lanequa Howard, I wanna thank CAP, NCAP and all of the supporting partners for organizing and inviting OCS to this important convening. And I would like to thank each of the panelists for supporting the responsible spending of CARES funding. It was kind of interesting to hear Denise's comments because you're gonna hear me say some of the same things that she just stated. So to me, that speaks to that we're all here together to work through um, how we can best use CARES funding to continue to meet the needs of our most vulnerable citizens. I was told that there are more than 500 participants registered for today's call. I am so proud to be a part of a network focused on meeting the needs of vulnerable families impacted by poverty. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted our nation as a whole and each community and each community uniquely. The health impacts have been devastating as well as the lives lost. Through steady progress, though steady progress continues, the economic impact has been equally staggering because of the CSBG network. And that means that you've always been telling us what's going on, what's going on in your community. So we know that you are paying attention. And I just wanna say thank you for paying attention CSBG network to the needs in your community but I still think we have time to do even more. Please remember throughout this entire presentation that CSBG CARES funding is flexible. CSBG CARES funding takes on many, all of the attributes really of CSBG regular funding and what we can do. And so we don't have, a, we have some boundaries and some limitations, which I'm sure all of you know, but really it's flexible funding that we should consider as we continue this discussion today on how we can use this funding responsibly. While the nation continues to recover, the cost of rent, utilities, food, and gas have risen sharply. Families who are struggling, they're struggling their budgets are being strained even more. And the impact of the um, pandemic has been felt disproportionately. And we know a lot of times our communities of color um, are impacted even the most by um, the COVID um, pandemic in regards to social determinants of health. I have to say to you all, if it was not for the federal government, states, tribes, and eligible entities and their response to the pandemic, I'm sure the devastation in the communities would have been even worse. So thank you again for all that you've been able to do to support your communities and your families and your individuals um, through what they need and what they need most in order to get through this tough time. With the overarching goal of reducing poverty, the flexibility of CSPG provides significant opportunities for gap filling services to address unmet needs, innovative strategies, and rapid response to benefit our most vulnerable individuals and families. As I've noted before, the community needs assessment should be telling us a story about what are the um, continuous needs of the families in our community and how can we start to really think about that over these next few months? Have we missed something? Are there gaps in the things that we've been able to do to serve families? Are there new innovative things that we can create? And I think through the, at the end of this session, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what are some tips and strategies to think about how you can continue to spend your CARES funding to meet the needs of families. It's not just about spending down the money, but it's most importantly, are you really, really, really addressing the needs in your community? And this is a great opportunity to take another look to see if there are other things that you can do in order to improve the lives of vulnerable people. It is critical though, that we demonstrate our ability to be responsive whenever we receive supplemental funding of this type. Can we be responsible enough to look at our community needs assessment? Can we think about creative things to do? Can we think upstream, how to prevent people from coming into um, situations in which they would have to um, have resources? Have we thought about things we can do once people are involved? Can we expand services? So there are a lot of things that we should be considering as we continue to think about how can we spend the CARES funding to improve conditions and to address needs in our communities. I know we can do it together. I know you are very intentional already in the things that you're thinking about, 
but we just want to nudge you and push you a little bit more because we still see that we have funding available that we can use to meet the unique needs of families and that we can use to strengthen communities and that we can use to help individuals. So I wanna take a few minutes now to show you where we are. So if we could go to the next slide in regards to the COVID CARES Act spending. So this analysis basically is telling us how we're doing on state level, territories, as well as tribes. And you can see in regards to the state, we are spending um, quite a bit of our money, but we're still not all green. Our goal is to look all green. The yellow says that we're spending at, a, we have spent 51 to 99% of our money. And you look at when you think about states, a small portion of states have not spent um, um, their money at a reasonable rate. And so therefore you see that little red line in the um, pie graph, and which shows that we still have some states that are spending very low amounts, less than 25% of their funding. And then we have states who are kind of like in the mid Point range, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move forward. Although we don't have a lot of territories that um, um, are a part of this because some of their money is, is considered combined, um, we do have ter ter territories in which are not spending um, at the rate that we would like. And so we see there's a lot of work we can do here when you think about how our territories are spending. And you see, even with our tribes and tribal organizations, we have some tribes that have spent out all of their money and we still see they represent all of the quadrants in regards to the percentage of funding that they're spending. So we really wanna see more green, we wanna see less red, and we do understand when it's emerging in the goal in which you have spent 51 to 99%, but we wanna see that continue to move forward so that we can spend out the money. And this does include the small states as well. Next slide. So we decided that we would just kind of show you from region to region how you're doing, um, because we think that would be very, very important as we think about the technical assistance that we can provide, the outreach that our technical partners can provide in regards to how we were looking at a, as, a, as a region, and we know the states that are in those regions. And we can see across the board, there's still a lot of work to be done because we don't have green, and green means that you spent 100%, but we do see that we're kind of, um, in between the 51 to 99 percent and the 25 to 50 percent and, and only a little bit of red but you can see there's a lot of progress to be made um, between the 51 to 99 percent and the 25 to 50 percent of spending um, as, as we look at this information um, through the payment management system and I want to take a few minutes because there may be a question before we move before we move forward well how where does the federal government get this information from we get this information from the payment management system, and we believe that's the best resource that we have in order to look at spending rates. We take that information and we analyze it based on state by state, territories and tribes, and we try to come up with the best guess of how spending is going. Remember, this is not real time, this is point in time data that we receive, but we believe it gives us a very good picture of what's occurring across the country in regards to spending CARES funding, and just for your information, we do the same type of analysis for regular CSBG and also for disaster funding for those who are participating in disaster relief. But getting back to the care spending, you can see we have a lot of work to do. You can see that there are opportunities to, to use those innovative approaches that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes to really expand outside of the box and think about are there other things we can do and are there gaps in services? And this depicts kind of where we are as a, as a, um, across the nation. Next slide. We have seen some improvement. Um, the Office of Community Services, all of the TTA partners have been reaching out to states, providing guidance. I'm sure the state associations have been um, 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 participatory and we're trying to encourage spending and thinking about ways to address gaps. So I think in, at the same time, we're telling the story that we have more work to do. We also want to show you that where we started as of January 22nd, and where we are as of April, 2020, April 2022, we are seeing some improvement, but we need to see these numbers drop tremendously to where we're already, spent. we will spend out the next time we have a bar graph like this, we'll be able to show you that we have spent out totally of our CARES funding um, as soon as possible and it's before um, October 1st of 2022, because the funding expires on September 30th, 2022. 
So I hope this information is helpful um, as you look at how we're spending estates and that we are making improvement, but we know there's some more work to be done. And we can't overstate that CSBG is flexible. If you have questions about how you're spending um, or some ideas you may have, you can reach out to your program specialist. You can reach out to the um, technical assistance partners, your state associations, and hopefully they will be able to provide you with guidance and information that will be able to kind of stimulate some of the thinking, think about the gaps um, of services, ask you to go back and look at your community assessment again to make sure you didn't miss anything, update your community assessment if, that, if that's necessary, but do whatever it takes to make sure that we take full advantage of this opportunity um, to support um, vulnerable families, individuals, and, and, and to strengthen our communities. Go to the next slide. So you can see as well with the tribal communities, we're working with tribes as well to make sure, to make sure we're thinking about how we can empower our tribes to spend the money. They don't have as much money as we have available, but sharing ideas through peer-to-peer -peer learning and um, following through and following up through our different mechanisms for technical assistance hopefully our tribes will be able to meet unmet needs in their community because they're one of the most vulnerable communities that we have. So I wanna take this time to say there's more to be done. You've done a great job. We're here to provide you tips, encouragement and motivation to keep focusing on how we can take full advantage of these resources to help people who need it most. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharice. Really appreciate it. And it's good to have the data. One clarifying question, and Clint put it in the chat too, just to be clear. This data includes the small states and it includes both, um, both allocations, correct? The percentages are incorporating of that? We, yes, it does show that. Yes. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. And we'll appreciate you hanging with us here, Sharice, and as questions and, and comments come in over the course of this webinar. Thank you so much uh, for that. So let's go to the next slide. I am pleased, so pleased that David Bradley is able to join us here today. And I, I know folks are so appreciative of the work David does on the Hill every day. But if you think back to two years ago, where we were as a country, not knowing what was coming down the pike, and that David was successful on the Hill to ensure that the first investments out the door included community action and CSBG, that is huge. Huge to have that billion dollars. David, you were successful during, you know, in those ARA days to get us the billion. You're successful um, um, here during CARES. We just say thank you, thank you, thank you. I know you have some comments that you'd like to make here today, and um, we will turn the ball over to you. Thanks for being with us, David. Well, thank you. Uh, and thanks, everyone, the uh, 400 plus involved uh, listening. Um, and uh, I think this uh, is really an important conversation to have, uh, extremely timely. And um, so I want to I want to approach this a little bit differently than the speakers you're gonna you're gonna hear. And my entry point in the conversation with you is over the impact of not spending. And up until the charts that Sharice uh, showed, I was uninformed about how much is left over. I don't hear many comments from the states, from, from cap agencies to me anymore about CARES Act dollars. So I was operating on the assumption that generally speaking, it's going fairly well. The numbers that Sharice just uh, put on the screen is worrisome. That is a, that's a problem and here's why. Um, we got, we did get a billion dollars in the CARES Act. It was sort of the first train out, and and you know that's that's what we that's what you want. You always want to take the first train because you don't know when the second train's coming. And um, in doing it, we mobilized a bipartisan, strong base of support in Congress to do this. And the billion dollars was the sweet spot. That's what that's a number that we feel comfortable with. We got an ARA, although the Obama administration opposed that. We got a billion dollars here, and that was uh, the Trump administration was a non-factor in what we did. So we were able to uh, make Democrats and Republicans comfortable and eager to invest a billion dollars extra in the community services network, the community services block grant, uh, and, and it worked out. 
But when you, when you basically mobilize a congressional coalition that way, the stakes increase. The, the risk to the, to the network is now tenfold. And it's, it's following. Uh, number one, if for some reason, these numbers continued along this path and you have 20 or 25, uh, God forbid, 30% carried over that not spent, it would be awfully hard to go back to Congress next time saying, invest again a billion dollars in the Community Action Network. They're going to be loath to do it. That's number one. Number two, we know from um, everything we're hearing about what the congressional agenda will be in 2023. And I can tell you, if the elections go the way I think they will, uh, and Republicans are in control of at least the House, they're going to look at all the unspent COVID money to recapture. And when they, when they go after recapturing unspent COVID money, it, it's not done in secret. It's not done quietly. It's done with a lot of press, with a lot of discussions, with a lot of, of, of visibility. That's the last thing we want is, is for Congress and the appropriators and the, the authorizers to see a major uh, problem in the community services block grant that we can't spend the resources. I think it leads to uh, other, other discussions, other scrutiny that we really, really don't want. Uh, so that's no, number two is, and three, I, I think it potentially is gonna jeopardize uh, FY24 appropriations as well. Uh, I, th I think that if there's this kind of money on spent, members are gonna take a second look at how much money they put in regular appropriations for the community services block grant. So the, the, the risk is enormous. And I worry about the Tom Coles and the Rosa Dolores and Betty McCollum's and Nancy Pelosi was involved, Bobby Scott coalition we put together. They might be reluctant next time to step out quite as forcefully as they did on the, on the CARES Act. So there's, there are political and congressional and legislative consequences that, are, that affect us immediately, but also long-term. But as, as uh, both Denise and Cherise have said, there's time to fix this. Not a lot, but there's time to fix it. And I, I think this has to be all hands on deck at figuring out how we, how we spend the money, obviously with fiscal guardrails and properly, but how, how we, bring this, this, uh, this number way, way down. So that's number one. Whatever it takes, I think the network's got to respond on this. Second, if there is some reason, if there, is, if there are barriers, obstacles out there to, to, to uh, uh, efficient expenditure of these dollars, people need to know about it. Let us know. Let the, let the, uh, the partners know. Let OCS know. We, People need to respond and try to knock out those barriers and, and correct it. Three is, is peer pressure. I think if you got agencies in, in, your, in your state that just aren't spending money, you've got to put peer pressure on them. They've got to do it. They've got to do it. Uh, this will, this will as, I, as I started off and as I circle back, this will have repercussions in Congress, unintended, that are not. Uh, not to our benefit, believe me. And, and I think uh, the September 30th um, deadline, we will not ask Congress for an extension. That would, that can't do it. Absolutely can't do it. We know that we know that even the 200% in the CARES Act, yeah, which I've carried forward in appropriation bills is gonna be a tough lift, a heavy lift in the regular appropriation cycle. So, going to Congress and saying, we need more time is a non-starter. Members will not want to do that. And I don't think a majority exists. You, know, you might have some Democrats, occasional Republican that's saying, oh, I'll help you on it, but you'll never be able to get a, a, a majority uh, in either the House or the Senate to go for it. And I also think it uh, could impact reauthorization. You know, we're, we're nearing um, today's, tomorrow's actually a big day on something we're involved with on reauthorization. And we may be on the floor sooner than people realize 
It'll be an interesting fight, but we know there's going to be a fight on, on the 200%, which we included in the CARES Act. But having a negative development, like not spending this major congressional uh, investment, comes at a bad time uh, when Congress is considering all the positive things, what we're saying and, and their belief in how we respond to community needs and how important we are in the community. That's the worst timing you could Im imagine, whether it's in the House or, or activities that we've, uh, you'll soon hear about in, in the Senate. Um, we don't want this. So this is, um, this is a big test for us. It is a test that we absolutely must pass with flying colors. There's gonna be other programs that have money uh, sent back. That's their problem, it's not ours. Our problem and our priority and our responsibility is CSPG CARES Act. No one but the network wanted this billion dollars. This is, we own this, this is us. So by taking ownership means we take responsibility. We wanna do everything we can to ensure that we meet what Congress anticipated on this program. So I just wanna reiterate um, that the bottom of my heart, this is important. This is a big, big, big issue. And uh, we cannot, we cannot go in there with 25 or 30% um, unexpended. And we also can't go in there with a number of states below 50%. Absolutely can't do it. And it, it would, believe me, it would be devastating. We get, we get one or two members right now. I just dealt, dealt with a member out <clears throat> yesterday. I, I traveled with a member. And he said, you know, I really like my community action agency, but I hear all these problems with other agencies that members tell me about. Um, I heard that in the 1980s. A lot of members, and I, I call it the Grassley effect. Uh, Chuck Grassley was the first one to bring it up to me. He said, you know, I love my programs in, in Iowa. It's the, other, it's the other states where they have all the problems. That, that really complicates my life. This adds a log to that fire. Adds, adds, adds rationale for those that argue against the program. So this is job one for the network is come through with flying colors on, on, on CARES and, and where you can shout out loudly how well you responded to community needs. Do it for yourself, do it for the next generation and, and community action. Do it to keep uh, opportunities alive and do it to keep moving our agenda forward. So I thank everyone, I'm gonna sneeze here. I thank everyone for, uh, excuse me, I'm gonna sneeze. Uh, everyone um, who's listening, but please, please, please make sure that everyone in your state is operating in sync together in harness, moving forward steadily to get uh, uh, CARES Act money out the door and in the communities and doing what Congress intended it to do. So that is my message and I'll stick to it. Thank you, David. I, I think your words of um, experience are well taken. I think your perspective that we have to also think down the path um, to the next crisis and we must succeed now in order to be the funnel for the next um, crisis in, in the country's response to it. We have proven ourselves in the past and we need to prove ourselves this time. And now is of the time. And yeah, those, those slides and those pie charts, uh, maybe we could go back two slides or three slides to the, yeah, the, um, That's yeah that one, right? There's a lot of rust color on this slide, and that means you are falling between, what is the rust? Um, 25 to 50%. There's a lot of rust on this map and or on these graphs, and that is a very concerning number. Now, the, the yellow, right, could be all the way up to 98%, so it's, it's hard to know. It might be helpful as we think about how to look at and break down the data aggregate disaggregation. It might be good to look at that 75 percentile, too. Um, so we could get a little bit of a read, but I, I know we were putting it, OCS was a great putting this together and ready for today's session. Um, yeah. The other thing is, Denise, that success in my mind is single digits. Mm -hmm. uh, not spent, single digits. Mm -hmm. uh, we ought to 
you know, we obviously ought to aim for 100, but that's that never happens. But we ought to be under 10 percent. That we can that we can justify. That we can we can work with that number. Uh, but double digits, yeah, particularly over 20. And, and, yeah. and, so, and some of these regions, I don't know what's going on in region nine, but some of these regions, we've, we've got to, we absolutely have to understand what's going on out there, why money's not being spent and what they need uh, to, um, to get this out the door. Yeah. And this is why when we talk about data-driven decision-making, right, this is good data for us to have. And I agree, you know, Sharice, I'll turn to you here in a moment. I know that um, it is a point in time it's always a little bit delayed because PMS is always a little bit delayed, a uh, payment management system for the PMS um, acronym there. Um, and I agree, you know, maybe a blue, a blue piece of the pie for the almost to the green, you know, and maybe some additional delineations. But again, you're, you're going to know your data best. What are your thoughts in terms of some of this conversation here? Um, well, a couple of things. Um, today, my goal was really to encourage thoughtful spending of the CARES funding. Mm -hmm. I wanted also to see what type of questions would come through the chat. Yep. That allows us to prepare for future conversations. And then finally, I want to make sure people know, and, and David alluded to it, we will be sharing this information regularly with the entire network in regards to how we're doing with spending. And so it, we're, it is all hands on deck. We know we have the support at least I believe we have the support of the national partners. That's why we're here. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to be focused on this over the next few months to see how we can continue to move the dial. When we look at this, we could have, we could break it down even more, but it would have been so many charts that it would have been hard for us probably to read it. Um, but we're open to other suggestions on how to share this information. Um, actually, I asked the group, the team to pull the information through March. So this is in this is through April yesterday. This is April what is that April 13th. Um, this is through April 13th how we look. This is this is close to real time. Mm -hmm. Get it. Um, yeah. so that we can really be relevant and hopefully meaningful to this discussion. Um, but we are open to sharing more and we will share with our um, national partners how it's broken down by state so that you can be even more targeted into how you provide support. Um, we're not able to break it down, of course, you know, to the CAA level, but between the state and the um, the CAA and, and the communication with the CAAs or the eligible entities, hope we can hope we can learn more. Um, so, I, but I do want to say something um, in result to the in, re, in response to the chat. We hear a lot of different reasons why um, this money is not being spent, and one that is very puzzling to us is we don't have any more needs that need to be met. And, and I'm not sure what that means. And so that's why even in my initial comments, we talked about going back, looking at your community assessment, going back and looking at you know, gaps that may be in services, expanding services to some of the most vulnerable families. But to say there are not any needs in um, different areas, it's just hard to understand that. And so Denise, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I did answer it with my heart that I think we can think about this a little better and that we can figure out ways to meet the needs um, across the country in all communities. I appreciate your, your, your response to this, Sharice. And you're exactly right in, in so many ways. And here we are in April, right? We may have a different conversation in July um, with the network, but we're here in April, right? Now is the time to truly look at your, your community's needs. And it came up in the chat, you know, does somebody really need to have COVID themselves or be impacted by the illness? And hopefully you saw um, Allison's response in the chat, folks, on the webinar, right? It's around the pandemic, which is impacting all of us are living. All of us are impacted by the pandemic. So the flexibility of CSBG, someone also mentioned that they don't have access to the 200% in their state, which understand that is a challenge as well. Um, but for, as for those of you who do have the 200%, that is a huge opportunity there that we can also use. Thank you also, Andrea, for the also in Andrea Olson from North Dakota for your clarification. Region 8 on here does have several small states, as does Region 10. So those small states do have a bit more time to spend. So that may be impacting some of the pace 
um, in some of this scenario. Appreciate that there's a ton of a ton of questions in the chat, and we will do some curation of those questions and see what we can do to uh, circle back to them here in a few moments. We want to talk a little bit about um, each of the kind of the roles of the of the groups are on this call, and Sharice really kind of pinpointed, I think, some of the roles of OCS. Right, they can provide us pretty close to real time information and data. Um, they're, they're committed to giving us information by state, right? We can't really go below that, but um, we can give you at least aggregation by state, which is incredibly helpful. And they've been a great partner here with the partnership with CapLaw, with NASCASP. They're just, they're really working closely with us. At the partnership, we'll talk here. I'm going to give the ball to, to Lana here in a few moments to walk through some of the, the spending concepts that have been kind of put pen to paper. But we can be here to hopefully support, offer advice and guidance and help tell the story. We've been working closely with state associations who have a distinct role to play as well for training and technical assistance and aggregation of data at the state level and bringing in innovative practices. Um, I'm going to turn here for before we turn to Lana to Jeannie at NASCASP and then to Allison at CapLaw to talk talk a little bit about the roles of their organizations over these next five months, and not to leave out the small states for the next year and five months. Uh, but um, uh, Jeannie, I'm going to turn to you first over at NASCASP. What would you like to share with us today? Well, thank you, Denise. I, I think, you know, just top of mind here is just that we all do have roles and we've all got to work together. I think, you know, this is a legacy moment for community action and we cannot let it go by without being successful and it takes all of us you know the the states as as some folks have noted here you know the oversight role the the contract and compliance role getting amendments approved uh helping be a thought partner with agencies about what is allowable and not allowable this is a very, very big playing field, as you said, Denise, that the pandemic has impacted life across all income levels, all areas. Um, I agree with Sharice completely to, to hear folks say, well, we've addressed all the needs is just puzzling. It makes one think that maybe there's some confusion about what is allowable. So if, if you are in a state, um, work with your state folks, work with your association. We all have to come together and make sure that this is success, not, not just because of the politics of it, but because there are people really struggling and suffering all over America. And we don't want a dollar of CSBG to go unspent when it could go to help people who are suffering and uh, suffering and struggling and trying um, trying to hold on during a really tough time. So states certainly have an oversight role, a leadership role, a coaching role. And, you know, at NASCAS, we're going to, you know, be talking with states in the coming weeks about what they can do to help uh, agencies on the ground and, and come alongside state associations and be successful. So we're going to work with all the partners as we always have and do what we can uh, from the NASCAS for perch to make sure that this goes well for everyone. Thanks. I'm going to turn here to Allison from CapLaw. And I, there's so many questions in the chat that we probably need to talk in some ways about. But um, CapLaw, you, Allison, you guys have just been out of the, you know, knocking it out of the park since day one, providing guidance, legal supports, uh, toolkits, you know, lessons learned, and just direct Q&A. Um, you've just really been fantastic. And I know your role doesn't abate in this moment. It probably increases, but would welcome your thoughts on the role that CapLaw can play and anything else you want to put on the table at the moment. I know you've probably been keeping an eye on the chat as well. Yeah. Um, it, thank you so much, uh, Denise, for, for pulling all this together in Lana. And um, and also just want to thank my team. Veronica is the one who's been manning the chat. So thank you for that as well. Um, and also OCS, Denise is absolutely correct. It's such a, it's such a boost to have OCS as a, as a true partner in these efforts as we, as we work through this challenge. Uh, I, I just wanna emphasize the initial slide that Denise had up there, which had the language from the appropriations bill with respect to what this funding is to be used for. And it's be, to be, to be used to prepare, prevent, and respond to the coronavirus impact, the pandemic. So that's that's 
very broad and there's a lot of response that needs to happen to the impact of this pandemic and uh you know veronica put in the chat and she can repost it and, and others are responding to it with respect to what that kind of response would look like and and lana's put together some really great information so i don't want to take up too much more time in the preceding slides to walk through what that response could look like our families have been impacted probably greater than 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 most in this time. They, they don't have the resources to carry them through these kinds of times. And that's why we're all here to make sure that we stabilize them so they don't suffer any more than they have suffered with respect to the challenges that they face. So just uh, it's important to continue to think creatively to try to meet that need as best you can. And CAPLAW is here as a coach, just like MassCASP is as a consultant, and to help you uh, feel comfortable with respect to accountability. Uh, we don't want uh, you to be calling us uh, with monitoring issues and concerns any more than anybody else on this call wants that to happen. So we all have our eye on that piece of it. So that's why we've all come together here today to try to reinforce that we are all here together to work through this challenge. And so lean on us, call us, uh, all of us. Uh, we're here to, to make this happen. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, Veronica, and everyone from Capla who's put who are also putting things into the chat to to get people linked up with the resources that you've put together um, over the past two years. Um, today's webinar does take me back about two years when we were doing these national partner calls with the entire network. And we, again, thank you so much for putting every, we're capturing everything in the chat. We will be copying that down and we will be sharing the theme certainly. And I know Sharice is probably taking notes and Andrew from OCS a mile a minute. We'll make sure to share uh, the content as well. So your thoughts and comments are going to be well taken. So I'm going to turn over here to Lana Schultz. Uh, Lana has been with us since um, early days of the pandemic, coming on, um, leading our CARES TNTA response. She spent many years at the Iowa State Association, has been with a public, with a local community action agency as well. So well grounded in CSBG, well grounded in disaster response in Iowa, and has just been a fantastic resource here. So Lana, I'm going to turn over to you to walk us through some of these core ideas that have been put pen to paper, which have come from the network. Um, mm -hmm. states, local agencies, state associations, and the national partners. So I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Denise. Yes, I get the privilege of sharing with you the creative and innovative ideas that agencies have come up with in order to meet the needs of individuals and families who are experiencing poverty and uh, making improvements in the communities where they live. So if you want to go to the next slide, please. We have a top 10 countdown, but it's probably more than 10. So forgive us for that, but there's just so many great ideas. We tried to fit them under 10 categories. So what are the needs of our customers? SNAP benefits that were extended during uh, the pandemic are ending. So meeting the dietary needs of your family is getting harder and harder, especially when you are um, trying to feed teenagers. Uh, in addition to that, food prices are up dramatically. So we know families that are needing help are really feeling the pinch when it comes to food and food insecurity. Transportation is a major problem for so many people. If you're working a minimum wage job and you're driving 20 miles to get to work and gas is $5 a gallon, how, how beneficial is it for you to go to that job? So providing some uh, gas cards, vouchers in partnership with uh, gas stations in order to help cover those expenses would be very helpful, as well as car repairs. When you're on a limited income, those are the things that get pushed to the side, and it impacts your ability to work, to get your kids to school, to get to medical appointments. Um, if, you're, if we're able to help relieve that stress for the family, it would be very um, important to provide that as a resource and help them be successful. And school's going to be starting. I know it's not even out yet, but it's going to be starting again in the fall before we know it. And we know families are going to struggle with school supplies because they don't have the resources to uh, meet that need. And it puts a real burden on the community. So let's step up and see that as a possible solution in helping us spend our dollars to help families. Next slide. Number nine, talking about kids. My gosh, I have... Um, 
a huge belief in the value of being engaged and participating in activities. And this is an opportunity for kids to have that chance uh, to get involved in some kind of an athletic experience, music, camp, anything that is a developmental activity uh, that can address some of their um, flexible hours during the summer where they have good adequate adult supervision. Uh, summer learning programs, Denise touched on this in the opening comments, uh, partnering with your library to provide some staff for a summer reading program, the list goes on and on, child care expenses. Um, somebody sent us an idea where they did a snack activity uh, as part of the weekend meal program. So as the schools were providing the backpacks with uh, food for the weekend, the Community Action Agency put in some snack activities for the kids uh, during the weekend. Next slide, please. Oh my goodness, health is huge. Um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau just released a report yesterday, $88 billion in past due medical bills. That's one in every five American is facing a past due bill when it comes to their health. And our push for vaccinations, our encouragement for people to get vaccinated is still important. And wellness visits also for a while, we were told not to go to the doctor. Uh, and so that's been pushed to the side. And because of that, many people are experiencing even greater health issues than they did before. The co-pays, dental is consistently an issue. Uh, this is a chance to be able to help families and their kids get the dental and vision care that they need. And you, you can't listen to the news without hearing about the mental health that kids and adults are facing because of the stress of this pandemic. And when you pile on top of that, the stress of poverty, uh, it seems to be impacting our customers even more. And we do know burial, bur burial expenses are an issue, an ongoing expense, but we also know uh, many of our families were impacted by death from COVID. And so we have seen an uptick in a request and a need to help cover those expenses. Next slide, please. Many of you were out there saving the day when it came to rental assistance through lots of different means. You were helping families maintain that housing because it was the right thing to do and because it produces better outcomes for families. So that rental assistance program was so helpful and so valuable and not everyone qualified. So here's a chance to help those that didn't qualify for the other funded programs who would become income eligible. Eviction protection, some agencies have sent us examples of partnering with um, entities that will provide legal assistance at the eviction hearings to buy some time for the family to be able to get help paying the rent. That's also a very valuable tool and water and utility payments. We had an agency tell us about three weeks ago, they could go through millions of dollars in, in a very short period of time. I can't remember, Denise, was it a million a week? Something like that, 1.2 million a week. Something so, that was in that ballpark, right? Just on emergency payments. And that's for water. So even though we have the LIWAC problem, program, there's still a tremendous need for help with water. Next slide. Technology, um, technology for your agency. You all, sent people home to work, if not everybody, a lot of your staff and being able to prepare, prepare, that's one of the purposes of these dollars, to prepare for having what you need to be able to do that again, to get your phone systems able to provide the services, even if you're not sitting in the office. Um, there's wonderful tools you can use to upgrade services to families, creating uh, online applications that make it easier for families to apply, uh, to do an online food pantry. We have a couple of agencies that have entered into a partnership where families just shop online, just like we do. They go online and pick what they want out of the food pantry. And when they come to pick it up, staff puts it in their car and they drive away, just like online shopping for everyone. We know our community partners have needs and we know our customers have needs when it comes to technology. Yes. Summer program, um, many, of that, many of those programs may end up being virtual just because of staffing issues and it's a way they can reach a lot, a lot more kids. And we need to be able to ensure our kids have the technology they need to participate in those summer act academic programs. And for families to have the technology to be able to apply online. 
Next slide. Customer engagement. Um, boy, we have a customer cohort for the CARES project and uh, we meet about once a month and every month we learn. We learn from them and their experience trying to get through this pandemic. And if you haven't engaged with your customers, now is a wonderful time to do that because they can tell you what's working. They can tell you what needs they still have that aren't being met. And they can be very instrumental in gathering that information from their communities. They're trusted. People in their community know them. And when they knock on a door, people are gonna answer the door as opposed to a stranger who comes in and tries to ask questions. Uh, having an advisory group, um, setting up a leadership program to help families, uh, especially the parents, but also kids to understand the concepts of leadership is important, especially when it comes to helping local communities understand the issues that they face. Families need the leadership skills to be able to do that. Just be sure to look at your operational due diligence on this. It can happen, but we want to make sure that you uh, follow the rules properly and CapLock can provide assistance on that if needed. Next slide, please. How about your own capacity? We've been hearing a lot about staff. We've been experiencing ourselves, exhaustion, burnout, a lot of trauma for staff who are engaging every day with families and hearing the difficult stories that those families are facing play, play, a, toll, play a toll on their well-being. So investing in some trauma-informed practices for staff for some self-care, looking at your benefits program, your retaining or opportunities to retain employees. Uh, what about your policies and procedures? Have those been updated due to what we've learned from the pandemic? Um, maybe it's your five years review of your bylaws. Maybe you need to add some information to your bylaws about crisis and pandemic. These are all opportunities for you to use CARES dollars to get you where you need to be when it comes to the capacity of your local agency. Next slide. Small business support, PPE supplies for child care centers and child care homes. Uh, oftentimes those small child care home child care centers don't get the attention that the larger ones do. Providing that uh, supply to them is helpful. If you have um, people who've lost jobs but want to maybe start their own business, it's a great chance to help them get some mentoring and be able to um, go and follow a dream that maybe they weren't able to follow before. Next slide. Job training, again, your operational due diligence here, but you could do a summer apprenticeship program um, with youth or with unemployed adults. Uh, you have opportunities to assist with the cost for training. Um, you know, our weatherization programs, early care and education career path projects are all out there. You have community colleges that you could partner with for certification programs. Um, you can hire families and, and youth for summer programs who could become summer employees. Those are all options and possibilities if they're providing services to families that have been impacted by the pandemic. And number one, those fabulous, wonderful pop-ups so many of you have been doing. The food, the diapers, I mean, it's, it's amazing, the semi-loads full of diapers that you've purchased and provided to families. Um, and again, helping families get ready for school and the gas cards and the vehicle repair. You could, you could help families get their oil changed while they're waiting in line in the pop-up line if you had a vendor who would be willing to, to help uh, defer the costs of getting your oil changed or your tires checked to make sure that you have proper air in the tires. All of those are, are unique needs that families need, that families are experiencing and these CARES dollars are a way for us to be able to help meet those needs. Thanks, Denise. Ooh, wow. <laughs> You're right, that was more than the top 10. Um, I oh. think there were the top 150 ideas. Who's counting? Who's, who's <laughs> counting? <laughs> Um, I've seen folks in the in the chat saying they'd like really want the chat and they really want the slides and we will be sending out the slides, the recording. We'll probably do a compilation of the chat to, to try to drive the themes and see what we can do to get answers before sending things back out. But um, we will try to uh, compile that in as quickly as we can to get that back out the door. So 
we'd love to hear more about what you need. And I think there are some questions certainly in the chat that we can circle back to today just to give you a heads up. Um, Alice, I'm going to be turning to you here in a moment um, and maybe Sharice as well. But um, what else can we do, right? There are toolkits, there are guides that we can put out, but if people aren't using them, it's really, you know, we really want to do stuff that's going to be valuable to you. We can do more of these kind of conversations as well. So please include that in the chat as well. Um, what kind of information you're looking for, how frequently things might be helpful to have conversations like this. But in, in the meantime, I'm going to try to pull out a few things here. And I know our team has also been keeping an eye on the chat. So there have been a few things that have jumped out at me. First of all, I guess we all need to take a road trip to New Jersey and go to Norwest Cap. I'm seeing a lot of good stuff coming out of Norwest Cap, Mark. Thank you so much for sharing all of that in the chat. There's always good stuff coming out of Norwest Cap. So thank you for that. But um, Allison, there's been a lot of chat about gift about gas cards, you know, cars to the grocery store, those sorts of things. And some folks in the chat have put in their solutions. What are your thoughts on how to navigate some of those gas card gift card concepts and concerns? Uh, yeah, um, so I was just um, looking up sort of what we, because we've gotten these questions before and I want to make sure that we're consistent in our responses. So I was just sort of looking up the way in which we've responded uh, to what we would sort of term as direct assistance. And, um, you know, our understanding has always been that uh, in emergency situations like the pandemic, that direct assistance is one way to meet the need. And the CSBG Act is clear in, in, in several uh, places. Uh, I'm not gonna cite um, the act per se. I'm not gonna give you the citation, but I, you know, it does have language in there about the provision of supplies and services, food, um, and anything necessary to kind of help in that area. Um, also, any means to meet the immediate needs of uh, and urgent needs of families and individuals. So that is in there. You know, the biggest, uh, and then when you look at things like um, FEMA guidance and other guidance, and even when you look at um, I am 156, it talks about emergency related services. I think the two places where, where perhaps the network struggles is um, but we've never really been in a situation where um, where something has lasted this long that is is still an emergency, right? Um, and it doesn't seem quite as emergency related because there have been some who of more means who've been able to kind of move on from this time. But our people are not those people. Our people are still struggling with the impacts of this pandemic. Um, that's why, unfortunately, we're all here to help them and assist them through this. And so I, I think that's something important to remember. And um, I think the second thing that I see a lot of questions about is having to do with the accountability with respect to cash assistance. And, you know, I think there are a number of ways that that uh, you could try to address accountability. I think our general guidance has been to sort of set some basic parameters around, you know, who's going to receive that direct cash assistance, uh, consider including caps on the amount and an individual or family could receive, uh, consider tying those gift cards and supply cards to specific uh, vendors that uh, you know the type of uh, product that they're they're giving out so that you, you know, so in other words, rather than just give a, a, a Amex card, uh, give a, a, ga a literal gas card to a gas station or to something that could, you could somehow tie to, 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 to that sort of thing. And I see people are putting some great information in the chat um, uh, it, with respect to maybe some things that they've done. So I, I think there are ways and, I, and, and we can go back and think more about that and establishing that accountability. Um, if, if others have developed sort of ways to kind of track that accountability, I think that would be really a helpful point to share. I think the key is just to think about, we need to make sure that we're serving families in a way that meets the needs and they have a lot of needs 
And while there's a certain level of trust that lies in everything we do, I think there are ways to sort of set parameters and track accountability um, to a degree that isn't um, inhibiting, right? You don't want to put something in place that makes it so difficult for people to take advantage of the benefit that the benefit isn't useful to them at all. So I know that that's difficult balance to make, but we're all tracking eligibility. Um, and, uh, you know, it maybe it's a matter of just uh, making some relationships with the local providers in your area and setting up ways for people to um, get the food and the and the and the resources that they need. So I think there's a lot of different uh, ways we could work through this. Thank you, Allison. And look at all that peer to peer support there in the I chat. Know. People are coming up with solutions left and right. That that's fantastic. And not everybody has those large change, I know, in your community, but for a number of folks, hopefully this is this is helpful. And this might be a, a question for Sharice and probably a little bit of Allison as well. A consistent comment, especially early on, was what about reallocation of CSBG cares within states and or within regions? What are the thoughts on that? I'm not aware, and this is something that I would have to investigate, that we could reallocate funding through regions because we use a distinct formula for CSBG allocation. So my first thought is that would not be something that we have mm -hmm. you know, authority to do, um, but I will, um, I will check and make sure so when we do our Q&A that we're able to provide a very concrete answer. But my guess is, is that that would not be something we would be able to do. However, within states, States most likely have policies um, in situations in which funds need to be reallocated. And so that may be a place that um, if states don't have that in place, a, a, a way to think about when funding is being, um, it's not being used or needed, you know, how do we reallocate according to our policies and procedures. And another thought about this is also in that if an if a eligible entity can't use the funding um, maybe there's some creative ways to work with them on a local level to use the funding because we're sure that needs still exist. So I hate to say just take funding away and put it somewhere else because I'm sure there are unmet needs um, in almost all communities. Um, so that's a, that's a harder one to me. I think it really gets down to what the community needs. But I also wanted to say, um, Denise, is that the date of 9-30-2022 should not be the only driver or 9-30-2023 should not be the only driver. If the small states spend out the money on January 1st, 2023, we're going to celebrate, you know I mean? So it's not like, I don't want that to be the driver. I know those parameters we have to work within. I know that we have to um, show our due diligence to spend this money out as quickly as possible. But I think if we focus on the families that we will get better results. And all of these tools and tips that have been shared today, my mind is blown at how much has just gone into this chat in regards to suggestions and recommendations. But please let your drivers be the families. Please check your policies and procedures and make sure that they align with how you're planning to spend your how you're planning to spend the CARES funding. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get good responses to many of these questions um, back to you so that people can continue to learn and we can transfer knowledge. That's a great point, Sharice, is to focus on the families and the communities that you're serving. I know, and they put it in, into the chat, I think it may have just come to us as, as hosts, but as a large nonprofit community action agency had a significant allocation of CSBG Cares and they spent it down in the first five months because that was that reflected the needs in their community. Um, it is all focused on the needs in that community. And we also know, right, we want to recognize that agencies and states, right, you've had a myriad of monies, right, coming in left and right. And how are you going to, you know, what has to be spent when and what has the quickest deadline and all that sort of thing is a reality that we certainly want to recognize and respect that it's been a balancing act. Um, and now we have time, perhaps now is the time to really pivot and see what those unmet needs really are in this moment, because these resources are, are going to need to um, be expended. So it's kind of a coming together, right, uh, of that. Allison, do you want to add on any of those allocation questions? Uh, I, no, um, okay. I I a hundred percent in in, in Charisse's camp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I mean, I I think there's a lot of flexibility there. I, I think, I mean, we've 
talked about this on a national partner and OCS level, and I think the focus is to make sure the first focus is to make sure you truly are meeting the need. And I think there is likely, and that seems to be uh, revealing itself in this in the chats, that there is some confusion or lack of clarity with respect to how you can assess that need uh, in relation to this funding. And so I think um, people understanding that the need um, is not just someone coming down with COVID and helping them get through that sickness, the need is so much broader than that. Um, and so I think uh, that clarity could help maybe take that reallocation question off the table. Pivot here to Jeannie to build on that a little bit in, in some of the, because if it is confusion, right, and we want to make sure we're stressing flexibility, NASCAS has such an important role to play, liaisoning with OCS, right, to make sure that the clarity is, because um, agencies need to work with their state offices, as we've noted on a few of these slides, right, Just work with your states, make sure you're following all of these pieces. Could you talk a little bit about um, what NASCAS might be able to do in that space to ensure that um, clarity is, is consistent across the country? Right, thank you, Denise. So I, I think I put in the chat that, and people may not know this, that actually the partners had a call with states and state associations Tuesday and had a very similar conversation uh, with them, sort of helping to affirm, you know, what we're, you know, the vision that we all have of what success looks like here. And then, you know, clarifying some questions. And so, uh, we will continue to do that. I was uh, chatting with Hugh and Lauren, who are also on this call and have been, you know, sharing some reactions to sort of see when our next engagement with members might be so we can address some of these issues that have come up about rapid response to amendments and, you know, helping to interpret things in maybe a more broad way. And, you know, if we don't have something planned right away, we'll create something where we have a conversation with states and share out a lot of the learning um, that is sort of happening today in the chat about maybe just not the complete understanding that everybody have ha has had and how can we make sure we're all on the same page, um, answer any questions that states might have about gas cards or, you know, whatever that might be. So we're, we are, you know, I didn't just say that you know, we're, we're gonna fulfill our role that those aren't just words, we'll put action behind that and make sure that the states are ha have an opportunity um, to understand what the issues are and get technical assistance and peer support and engage too. So we're, we're committed to doing that. Great. Yeah, I've seen some issues in the chat about cash flow, right? If you're submitting invoices to get reimbursed for, for things, if you're not able to ma maintain that cash flow, uh, delays on budget modifications, right, if you're trying to move things maybe into supplies or other sorts of purchases out of personnel since hiring has been such a challenge in many parts of the country. So um, I appreciate your comments, Jeannie, on that and all the work of the team at NASCASP. Uh, so appreciate that. What am I missing in the chat? I'm trying to keep up with it, but are there other themes? Um, Allison, Jeannie, uh, Sharice, or Lana that you'd want to address that have come out? The see big issue, pop up. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. The issue of um, not maintaining the 200% eligibility. Is there any message about that? I've had several in the chat mention that. Sharice, you want to clarify the 200%? And well, when they, say, I'm not sure what maintaining means, but I do know the way that the act, the CARES Act, was written. It was up to 25, up to 200%. So states had an option on how they wanted to um, implement that. Um, beyond that, of course, I don't know what may happen in the future, um, but we're holding, we're, we're very excited and pleased that we're able to serve more people because more people are now teetering on that need in regards to um, um, being in poverty. And so this helps tremendously um, in addressing those needs. But regarding the future, I don't have any comments. Denise, I would just encourage everyone on this call today. We have hundreds of folks, hundreds of community action people on the call, but that means we have hundreds and hundreds that aren't on the call today. 
And if folks can go back in their sphere of influence in their state and talk with their peers, talk with their state association, invite your state office to the next, you know, EDs meeting and have a joint conversation in your state about where are we at. You know, a state can share information with their agencies about the herbal amount, share, mm -hmm. share that brainstorm together, just replicate this good, juicy conversation that we're having here today, ideas, problem solving, replicate that in your state ASAP. Uh, those of you that are on the call today, be a leader, go back in and say, we have got to have a local state call um, about this and, you know, get our house in order in our state across all our partners. So uh, that would be, you know, one to do that I would encourage people uh, coming out of today. Yeah, and I'll just build on that, that, you know, I think one of the most um, sort of um, refreshing, um, positive uh, bit of feedback I've gotten during this process is, as we've worked on this on the national level in this area is just to hear um, from, and I'll just call out Arkansas and Beverly Buchanan and her efforts in her state uh, and just, you know, the collaboration there and the state really contacting um, all of its members and, and really just saying, what do you need from me to make this happen? And, and the CIA is responding to that and stepping up to the plate uh, to work with their state. I think that level of collaboration is, is, is probably um, what's going to help us get over this finish line. Uh, at this point, it's it's definitely a group effort, um, and uh, just reiterate the need is there. Like we just need to make sure we're tapping into that need. Um, and I think along that same line, Allison, sort of how do we all get there? You know, I know that some folks raised some questions about reallocation of money. If an if one agency wasn't spending, could it be reallocated? And we can look into that and we can provide some guidance to folks. But the problem there is that people in that area need the help, right? So if it gets reallocated, then those people who are experiencing low income don't get the rental assist, you know, whatever it might be. And I think a better approach that we should all try to take as a network what do we have to do to help that community action agency if they've stubbed their toes, maybe their staffing is really, you know, struggling, or maybe they've had a lot of leaders sick, or who knows why, but what do we do to help that agency succeed as a network in our state? I'd like to see us put our energy towards that versus, well, how do we reallocate money? And then those, those folks in that community are kind of left stranded. So, you know, maybe and, and there's, I, yeah. And yeah, and I'll just add, I'm not sure this was on the slide, but, you know, there is, in an instant, as you were talking about sort of the operational challenges that could lead to, to um, struggles in this area in spite of need, um, you know, there's, there's sub awards, there's, there's options if, if for some reason an operational challenge is there. And so I think it's important, and, and a lot of people have put into the chat these partnerships and these relationships so I, I think that's part of thinking outside of the box and, and realizing that that's a possibility and also realizing, you know, it's likely, while I, I think we're all really creative and innovative and, 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 and special people, it's likely that the idea you came up with on some level has been thought about by someone else. So don't reinvent the wheel, reach out to your state association, reach out to your national partner, and, and see what can be provided to you to help jumpstart perhaps a new effort that, that you've never engaged in before, mm -hmm. uh, because it's quite possible that someone else has, even though it might be new and innovative for your area, it could be a, a trodden path somewhere else. And so I think that's one really important aspect to consider uh, when you're thinking about all your options. And Allison, um, something that you and Jeannie said that kind of sparked this thought, to me, I know everyone is tired. I mean, this has been a long journey and we're hoping that these calls and future calls will kind of get some synergy going to where we haven't had a chance to really think about other things to do because of just the fatigue that goes along with being in a pandemic for more than two years. 
So I know there's a lot of fatigue probably throughout the network, but we're here, the federal office, as well as all of the partners um, to support you in thinking through and getting through this hard time, because I'm sure that you've probably thought about things and just haven't had a chance to execute them or didn't know how, um, just because of just pure fatigue. And um, we hope this will be a time, at least I hope this will be a time in which you're kind of energized, inspired in a different way to go back, look in your communities to see what, you know, maybe um, some other things that you can do so that we really can meet the needs of the families. Great. Well, in the interest of making sure that we have time to look at some more of these um, more detailed questions and such, I'm thinking that maybe we do a kind of a round robin here for some final comments. And again, we are committing to co um, curating these questions, trying to get some answers, packaging them up and getting them back out to the network, as well as the great ideas that are here, adding to uh, Lana's top 150 list, we can add a few more additional uh, pieces to that. I also, one other piece of uh, building on what Jeannie said about having state level conversations, many state association conferences are happening because our team is attending many of them in person. If there's not already um, a time for conversation about CSBG care spending at your regional and or state association conference, please create one. Please create that in person or if you're virtual, create that opportunity for real conversation. May is Community Action Month. We know you're gonna be telling your story. It's also the time to have some of these conversations and planning mechanisms, so thank you for that. I'll also just say, and it was probably in, in Lana's list, um, I have some family visiting for uh, the holiday this weekend. Between me and my husband, we just spent 40 bucks on tests. They talk about, right, the way we're gonna navigate an endemic is to make sure we have proper PPE. Tests alone are going to be something that we're going to need in order to navigate safe situations. Just putting that out there. So with that, um, I'm going to turn first to Jeannie, then Allison and Sharice, and we'll wrap up today. Jeannie, what would you want to leave people here with today? I think just, you know, reach out, communicate, talk, reach out to the national partners, reach out to the state association, to the state. Don't... Um, wonder about things that somebody as somebody just said maybe it was Allison you know it's probably been thought about folks have already put some thinking into it I put um, the partnership strategic America story link into the chat because you know there's a bunch of stories right there about what people have done take a look at those uh, there's a lot of resources and we're we all have the same north star and that's to help as many people as we can uh, who have low income during this time. So how do we do that together? Um, let's just keep talking and keep communicating and keep asking questions. Thanks. Uh, absolutely. I, um, Jeannie uh, put that so well. And I, and I think communication and collaboration is, is really the key during this time. And uh, I think also um, being flexible and and willing to sort of uh, take on the challenge uh, when I know that that we're all at, at, at a limit at some point. Uh, but just remember, uh, we're all here. We're all in this together. It's actually a really large supportive network. So don't hesitate to tap into to the network. And from the Office of Community Services um, and support uh, with the support of our departments, we can do this. Those are words to live by. We can do this. We are community action, CSBG works, whatever hashtag you want to do it. We can do this and we will do it. Well, thank you to everybody who has um, put stuff into the chat, has asked hard questions has taken away some new things and to put their, their creative ideas to share with others. Peer to peer in this network, that's the way we work with each other. That's the way we, we build on each other. So thank you. Thank you to the national partners, Sharice. We really appreciate OCS's partnership. Thank you, Allison and Jeannie uh, with Cap Law and uh, NASCASP. And I know David had to bow out, um, but we just so appreciate David and the whole team at NCAP as well. So, and thank you to the entire team at the partnership, um, Lana, Aaron, 
Tiffany, everyone's just really, and Mary Beth is really doing a great job here as we try to do as what we can. Look for the email. Please, please, please have dialogues at your board tables, at your state association meetings. We're happy to come in virtually in any of these meetings and have these conversations. And when we're on site, we're happy to have conversations as well. So with that, we're going to sign off and just say thank you, everybody. And we will see you very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.